All right, so I apologize if I'm gonna be breaking the illusion here, but Nintendo is, in fact, a Japanese company. Mario's a pretty fun guy, right? Saving princesses, going to space, teaching typing, this pseudo-Italian plumber from Brooklyn has been on many adventures in his 40-plus year career. And one of the bright sides of the video game industry as a whole is that despite many of these games being developed in Japan, they've also been localized and released in other regions, so no level of language barrier can stop anybody from experiencing those adventures. And plus, you know, the sheer convenience of just turning a game on and getting to play it from start to finish is just... I mean, that part's just nice. And of course, that ideology isn't exclusive to just Mario, Zelda, Donkey Kong, Pokemon, Kirby. We should really be thankful that when we have new main entries in those beloved franchises, or even spin-offs, everybody can get their hands on them. Or so you thought. There are so many Nintendo games that never left Japan. You may know that much. I mean, come on, look at Mother 3. That's that game's defining feature. What you may not know, though, is just how many games there are that Nintendo decided to make and release in Japan and say, hey, you know what, the rest of the world, they don't deserve it. And yes, we're specifically talking about Nintendo games here, not the entire video game industry as a whole, because then it just starts to get really muddy. You know, we got Japanese board games that are in there, there's a bunch of visual novels and RPGs. It's just a minefield that I'm not ready to get into. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna stick to what I know best, because all I'm saying is uh, Donkey Kong 3 never left Japan, and I'm tired of pretending like I'm not bothered by it. But first and foremost, a thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a different kind of monthly membership box, delivering a box of awesome top shelf goods from under the radar brands right to your front door. There is a vast array of different products on offer here, from outdoor gear to home and kitchen goods, even clothing is an option. Each box of awesome includes roughly $70 worth of goods inside, but the cost for you, only a fraction of that. And the best part, the items that are offered to you are all based on a preference quiz that you fill out once you make an account. So you can have your box tailor-made for you. But say you want to swap to a different box or skip that month entirely. No worries, you only pay for what you want. Here's uh, here's what I got my hands on. I got the plated box, which came with the sweet serving bowl with a little cup in the middle for like a, a dip for chips. Uh, big fan of this one. It is now a perfect centerpiece for the group get-togethers that I've been having, especially with the holidays coming up. And it could also be paired together perfectly with the Scorch box, which came with a nice lineup of hot sauces. Clearly, I went with a specific theme here, and I'm not upset about it. But man, it's just... God, th this video that I'm working on is is really gonna be a lot. If only I had, like, a, a julep box that came with, like, two julep cups, some spoon straws, a crushed ice tray, a cocktail muddler, simple syrup, and a recipe card for how to make three specific julep drinks. Oh my god. It only took getting one of these boxes, but I am already a big fan of what Bespoke Post has to offer. And if you're interested, click the link down in the description and enter the code ANDDUDE20 at checkout to get 20% off your first box, or go to bespokepost.com slash ANDDUDE20. With that all being said, now back on topic for things that you can't easily get your hands on. Donkey Kong Jr. Localized. Donkey Kong Jr. Math. Localized. Unfortunately, but sorry, America, Donkey Kong Jr. plus Jr. Sansu Lesson, this combo pack is exclusive to Japan. That'll... that'll... that'll show us. It's... it's so weird, this piece of software. DK Jr. is missing two of the four stages, so it's just two stages that loop over and over again, and then Math is lacking the multiplayer mode, so sorry, you can't bring your friends along for that one. And apparently this was a pack-in game for a specific Sharp C1 Famicom TV? Um, okay, I, I mean, I understand why this didn't get localized, but now I don't know why this was ever made in the first place. Oh, I really want this TV, but I hope it includes a gorilla that teaches me math. With Nintendo's obvious roots in Japan and how the markets across regions are very different, it should really come as no surprise that the company thought some of their releases simply didn't make sense financially or emotionally to release elsewhere. Pokemon Green, an earlier version of the first generation that's generally less polished and features way worse sprites for the Pokemon in battle. While it did release alongside Pokemon Red, a game that we would eventually get, and when the remix came around we had Fire Red and Leaf Green, in reality, our Red for the Game Boy is based off of Japan's third version of that gen, with Blue. And since they already had the better versions ready to go, you may as well localize the best versions you can, right? That's a story you're all familiar with. But how about this one? Okay, you knew about Mother 3, of course you did. But did you also know that Mother 1 and 2 also released for the Game Boy Advance as a combo pack? 
They didn't get roughly shrunken down to fit the handheld screen like the handful of classic NES series games either. All of the sprite work would remain intact despite the smaller resolution to provide a really solid versions of those games years before Nintendo started to care to port the console versions to all of their digital services. Reggie couldn't be bothered giving us Mother 3. You know we never even gave Mother 1 plus 2 a passing glance. There's, uh, this Kirby Star Stacker for the Game Boy that got a Super Famicom sequel. Never really understood why this didn't get a worldwide release. The console already had four Kirby games, so you reskin Puyo Puyo for Avalanche and that's fine, but you leave a Kirby-specific puzzle game in Japan? God, I mean, we just simply don't have enough Kirby games to play here. I gotta be honest here. This would have been great. Yakuman DS. Okay, yeah, I think that one speaks for itself. Damn, and you guys released Wii Chess in Japan and Europe, but not in America? This, this is where you drew the line? And if you thought this business strategy was a relic of the past and the industry has been so much better about localizing anything worthwhile nowadays, that's really not the case. Sure, there are some outliers. You got Mario Super Picross getting a release on the Nintendo Switch Online service. Uh, there's the original NES Fire Emblem. That got full on localized with that digital release that was limited for some stupid reason, that was weird. The mysterious Murasame Castle got a virtual console release only on 3DS and nothing else. God, this company. Famicom Detective Club got full-blown remakes on the Switch. That's super cool. And even if we do start to look all the way back to the Famicom days, it's not difficult to start playing the Japanese exclusive Joy Mech Fight, one of the few times Nintendo attempted to make a proper fighting game. And you know what? It's not anything complicated technically, but it's still pretty satisfying to play to this day. With so many NES games that feel super dated, this game right here, Joy Mech Fight, a Nintendo-developed fighting game, still pretty good. And hey, Sukupon even showed up in Smash, so he's not totally forgotten. But fast forward, have you ever heard of Buddy Mission Bond? Yeah, me neither. In Japan, in 2021, Nintendo released this super stylized detective visual novel with these on-foot investigation segments, and it looks pretty cool. But unless you can speak Japanese, well, you better get your phone's translating app ready to go for the entire ride. I, I, don't, I don't know why this is still in Japan. This would be really cool. That's, that sucks. And hey, if you're watching this video in the future and Buddy Mission Bond has been localized, then why did you wait so long, Nintendo? God, these, com these companies make such weird decisions sometimes. So I've been on a bit of an import kick lately. Got a whole bunch of Japanese Nintendo games right here. We're not gonna be looking at every single Japanese Nintendo game, but certainly these and a whole lot more. I mean, I, I own this. Did, did you think I didn't? But, in general, there is a whole world out there of Nintendo games that you've not gotten to experience because they said that you really shouldn't. But thanks to the world of emulation, fan translations, and quite frankly, a lot of these games not having a language barrier to worry about at all, now's the perfect time to give a lot of these games a shot. So let's take a look at some of the best, the worst, and the wackiest Nintendo games that have stayed in Japan. Where are my And Kinsaku fans at? Okay. Sure, a minigame collection for the Wii with this quirky little tablet screen head looking character. You know, this was the Wii, like I said, of, of course this exists. This is And Kensaku, a Japanese exclusive minigame collection developed by Nintendo and... Uh, Google? Why? It's a compilation of 14 different minigames all about trying to see which Google search topics have more hits than the other. And there's like this tutorial that teaches the player how Google search trends work and, and whatnot. This is, this is so strange. The game would even use Nintendo Wi-Fi connection to make sure the results were up to date. That's shockingly ambitious. There's not much more to it than that. What you see is what you get. It's just that what you see is bizarre and I love it. Since this is purely based on the Japanese language and topical data that cannot be accessed anymore due to the Wi-Fi services being shut down, it just remains now as an interesting little novelty that I'm surprised hasn't been attempted since, and that it's Nintendo of all companies that are responsible for this. The fact they even bothered to give Ant Kensaku a spirit in Smash, quite frankly, is a miracle because I have never seen this thing before in my life. Give me a new trivia game based on... A Ask Jeeves next. All right, guys, relax, please, hold the applause. Uh, yeah, all right, all right, so this one, this is Undake 30, same game. And in this long forgotten puzzle game for the Super Famicom, you just click on icons that will disappear if they're next to the same icons, and then they fall down, and then you can make new matching possibilities. That's it. 
It turns out the titled Same Game is a pretty common, simple puzzle game in Japan, so I guess having a Mario version, that makes sense. Later on, we got Puzzle and Dragons with Mario, so I'm sure everyone else thinks that's weird, so... Yeah, I, I think, I think Undock A30 Same Game is weird, I apologize. What's fascinating about this, though, isn't even its existence, but its release strategy. While a promotional cartridge does exist, this game was primarily distributed by the Satellaview service, a joint effort between Nintendo and a popular Japanese radio company, St. Giga, to broadcast specific games and other forms of entertainment to be, quote, enjoyed at specific times via satellite. Really ahead of its time, considering it sounds like a much more pleasant streaming experience than we have all the way here in the future in 2022, Rest in peace, Google Stadia, you should have stuck to Ankensaku. Oh, and that also reminds me of that Game Boy Color game, Mobile Golf. It was like a pseudo-sequel to Mario Golf that not only had unique content, but also allowed players to essentially connect online over a phone network to play with others using the Mobile Adapter GB peripheral. That is so neat, and man, they were really trying some cool stuff in the 90s in Japan. But the Satellaview, you want to talk about Japanese exclusives, you can't get more exclusive than this. Thanks to the service, we got so much unique content. There's a bunch of tiny minigames with Kirby's toy box, remixes of F-Zero with modified cups and even a couple new tracks, a version of Mario Paint that has actual controller support instead of requiring the Super Nintendo mouse, and because everybody using the service were playing the same games at the same exact time, in combination with the SoundLink feature which allowed for streamed audio, there were these really cool things, like this exclusive version of Super Mario All-Stars that was bookended with these, like, fully voice-acted radio cutscenes. That's so cool! I mean, the game itself is just Mario All-Stars, so whatever, but it's really neat that they managed to pull this off all the way back in the late 90s, and the fact that some of these very time-specific features have been preserved for viewing to this very day is honestly incredible. And also, when you look up the names of a lot of these games, like with their ROM files and whatnot, they all have BS in the title, and stupid baby brain me thinks it's funny. Did you get it? It's an acronym for bullsh- You know how Tetris Attack in America and Europe with Yoshi and friends is just a reskin of Panel de Pond from Japan? I mean, wow, Yoshi and the Tetris title was gonna sell a lot more of a game than Lip the Fairy? I can't believe it. Well, for a limited time, Satellaview broadcasted a Japanese version of the Yoshi version. This is the only way a Japanese version of this game exists. And hey, more panel to pawn is never a bad thing. Speaking of, Nintendo Puzzle Collection. Oh man, Dr. Mario, Yoshi's Cookie, and Panel to Pawn all on one disc. That is so cool. And if you had a GBA link cable, you can connect it to this game to get unique versions of those puzzle games to your handheld. That is so, oh God, I love it so much. This game was once advertised for America, and then they decided to cancel the localization. I'm so mad. And yet you create Donkey Konga. Nintendo, you son of a, <sighs> sorry. Whew, sorry, sorry, got a little heated, I apologize. Also on the Satellaview service, you got these pseudo-sequels of A Link to the Past with The Legend of Zelda Ancient Stone Tablets, a four-chapter adventure that was constantly being narrated to you with actual voiceover. But even more cool, in my opinion, is another Zelda game that is a full-on remake of the original NES adventure. I can't believe a full-blown remake of that game actually exists in an official capacity. It's not really any better or worse than the NES version, it just kind of looks better, but hey, looks nice. There's this strange version of Excite Bike with Mario characters in it, which is really just a cute novelty more than anything. For a game with Excite in the title, it's a bit of false advertising, I'm gonna be real with you. Dude, there was even a version of Wario's Woods featuring the comedians from the classic Japanese TV show, Bakusho Mandai. The most ambitious crossover in history, am I right? Clearly this was all meant to be a follow-up to the Famicom Disk System game All Night Nippon Super Mario Bros., which was the original game, with some stages from Lost Levels sprinkled in, uh, World 1 now takes place at night, so much more atmospheric now. And like all of the graphics have been replaced to look like real people from the All Night Nippon Japanese radio program. Of course. Man, this game of Super Mario Odyssey is really fun, but... It could really use the cast of Saturday Night Live. But I hear ya, I can tell you're starting to complain, this is a whole lot of nothing games that are no more than cute pieces of trivia, that's it. And in all fairness, there's plenty more too, it's tough to actually hit all of them. 
we're gonna just ramble on for the last few of these here. Uh, Donkey Kong Land 3 got a Game Boy Color version only in Japan. Game & Watch Gallery 2 got an original Game Boy version only in Japan. There's the re-release of Super Mario 64, the Shindo version, which implemented rumble functionality, eliminated the backwards long jump to kill speedrun potential, and also removed Mario's So long, eh, Bowser? So it is infinitely worse, that part's obvious. The e-reader, how can you forget about the e-reader? Got a whole bunch of NES cards, it was a dumb, dumb thing, but in Japan, there were exclusive cards that added some extra stages to Mario vs. Donkey Kong, and even cooler, three totally original puzzle games for Pikmin 2. There's mini games, and Pikmin 2 only accessed via cardboard from Japan. You can play these easily in an emulator now, thank God, because they're pretty good, and I'm very upset we didn't get them. A lot of you know about the Animal Crossing debut on the Nintendo 64 disk drive before the GameCube, titled Animal Forest, and it is really neat to see this game play on an older console, but it is more or less the same game. It's not like the GameCube version was a technical marvel anyway. But like I said before, they're all interesting little nuggets of info, but not much more. I don't see you jumping to play them anytime soon. I'm sorry, but Yoshi no Cookie Kurupan Oven de Cookie sounded great on paper, but it acts like a promotion for a specific Japanese oven? and only 500 copies of the game were ever made. And you know, I, I, lo I love cookies more than the next guy, but you ain't gonna catch me spending. <laughs> oh, game collecting is stupid. And besides, who even cares? Nobody's gonna care at all about this unless you're gonna provide, I don't know, eight different versions of Picro- Oh my god. As a part of, not the Satellaview service, but the Nintendo Power service in Japan, no, not to be confused with the magazine brand, man, they really did try some cool stuff in Japan, you had these cartridges that were rewritable, and by going to a special kiosk, you would be able to download a game of your choice and take it home to enjoy for however long you wanted, no time restrictions like the Satellaview. And while this concept did start for the Super Famicom, it would soon extend to the Game Boy as well. A lot of the games on offer were normal retail games, the Donkey Kong Country Trilogy, Super Mario Land 1 and 2, Yoshi's Cookie for the Game Boy, thank god that's there. But exclusive to this service, 8 full Picross games, titled Picross NP Volumes 1 through 8. This Picross idea certainly isn't something Nintendo came up with. You can find these puzzle games everywhere, on every console, there's like a million of them on your phone, you got plenty to work with. But it's definitely strongly associated with the Nintendo brand more than anybody else. And what's neat about these in particular is there are a bunch of Nintendo characters as puzzles. Each of the volumes specialized in a different game. Pokemon, Donkey Kong, Mario, even a dedicated Wario version. They did do something similar on the 3DS with Club Nintendo Picross and the sequel, Club Nintendo Picross. Plus, which again, only in Japan, through the Club Nintendo Rewards program, and yeah, a ton of puzzles with Nintendo theming. Does Nintendo not think we would like their characters in their puzzle games? There's like 10 of these games on the Switch so far, and the only video game based one in these early years of the console is Sega Genesis themed? I mean, that's cool I guess, but I don't want to do a Bonanza Bros puzzle on Switch, I want to do a Sushi Striker one. Nintendo, you son of a the Nintendo Power Service also offered Wrecking Crew 98, though that also got a proper retail release. Oh yeah, there's an Honest to God sequel to Wrecking Crew for the Super Famicom. It even includes the original game on the cart. That's kind of cool. How many NES games are straight up emulated for the Super Nintendo? That's unheard of, actually. God, this game. Okay, so they took Wrecking Crew, which was fine. It's a, it's a fine game. You could turn it on and play it. It's a functional video game. They took that and made it a competitive puzzle game with a story mode. And usually, I'm all for this. Once again, Paneled Upon, one of the greatest games of all time. More stuff like that is great but this is one of the most confusing puzzle games of all time. Trying to get the color blocks where you want them to, moving around individual rows to attempt and eventually fail combos, getting screwed over by the bricks that cover the blocks so that it just messes with your plans even more, it's a nightmare, I don't like this one bit. The matches take forever because I feel like I'm just mindlessly mashing blocks and making no progress until suddenly, oh hey, look at that, I won. It's not good. I'm sorry to all of you diehard Wrecking Crew 98 fans out there, but this ain't for me. For my money, in this heated Mario puzzle game debate of the late 90s, Mario and Wario is the better choice. That dastardly Wario has put a bucket on our hero's heads, and only with the help of this fairy Wanda can we ensure that these idiots don't walk off the ledges and fall to their demise. I love this game. Sure, it is a totally different style of puzzle game, so it's not really comparable, but listen. 
I just had to make sure I mentioned Mario and Wario, okay? This game is really cool and should have gotten a sequel on the Wii U since we had the tablet, would have saved the console. We got a stupid Mario vs. Donkey Kong minis game instead, and I'm sorry, this game is just better than all of those. Wrecking Crew 98, though, I mean, I will give it credit, this was the origin of the Mario Maker helmet. That's... that's an interesting piece of trivia also. I, I like... I like that little nugget. And considering there is a story mode, I can't help but appreciate the little cutscenes that go into them. It makes me want to play the game more. Ooh, a secret path? Alright, sure. Let's just see what's on this path A here, and then... then we'll move on. <laughs> what? Oh I, t oh, I take it all back. Our next opponent is a genuine jelly donut. I'm so excited. This... <laughs> oh! Oh my god, it's like... It's actually just like rolling around and breaking blocks with its whole self. And I lost? This... <laughs> oh! Hey, I take... You know what? I take it all back. This game is amazing. Mario is Nintendo's golden boy. Naturally, most of these games fall under that umbrella. It doesn't matter how much of a household name that plumber is, once again, a lot of these games, Nintendo thought, people outside of Japan, not worth it. It's a good thing this is the same company that funded Devil's Third. But now it's time to go outside the box. A lot of those Mario games are cute little footnotes and not much more than that. But now, the rest of the franchises, that's where stuff gets interesting. Hope you like frogs and tomatoes. Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga and The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, two of the greatest games in Nintendo's handheld legacy, I don't think that could be disputed. Games that took the characters that we knew and loved and a bunch of the series staple mechanics that we're all accustomed to and twisted things just enough to create their own unique adventures and identities. However, little known fact, both of these games had relatively low-key predecessors in the form of Tomato Adventure and The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls for the Game Boy Advance and original Game Boy, respectively. And yes, these games stayed in Japan, but now they both have excellent fan translations. And that's awesome! Do you remember Richard from Link's Awakening? Maybe the assist trophy Prince Sable in Smash Brothers? Well, those are both characters from Frog Game. Also in Smash, there's the Demille Spirit, where Isabel gets stronger after eating Maxim Tomatoes with Mario and Luigi music playing in the background. That's a reference! That's a tomato adventure reference! Oh my god. The frog for whom the bell tolls tells the story of a rivalry between two princes, Richard and Sable, where Richard is always the winner. Once a neighboring kingdom is in danger and Princess Tiramisu is captured, Richard goes out to save the day, with Sable following Sue trying to catch up. And then, well... Every everyone turns into frogs. It happens. However, Sable is the one to discover a way to easily transform back and forth with his human form, and eventually a snake form on top of that. And with that, it's Sable's time to become the hero he always wanted to be, and discover the secrets the kingdom holds. And really, while some elements of this may bear a similar resemblance to Zelda, this is really its own thing. If anything, a lot of the wackiness with the off-the-wall characters that Link's Awakening is so known for, that is all over this game. The charm is immense, and the sprite work really gives off a ton of personality despite its simplicity. Like, eventually you go on a quest to find Wasabi for an employee of this company called Nintendo. It's awesome. Gameplay-wise, again, looks like Zelda. Got the whole big world to explore and all that, but all of the dungeons here are presented in this side-scrolling platformer style, with very little in terms of actual puzzles. Rather than solving environmental puzzles with the tools that you gather along the way, this adventure is more about a balancing act of managing your items to change between your three forms for the sake of navigation and battling. And speaking of, the combat is really just a matter of touching an enemy, letting things play out, and then just kinda hoping that you have enough hearts by the end. This... This isn't a combat system. If an enemy is too tough, that means you're not allowed to get past them, and you have to go somewhere else. That's how they stop progress from just exploring wherever you want to go. And this constantly learning where you can and can't traverse to leads to a very unforgettable quest that only lasts a few hours and has next to no downtime. Yeah, there are some parts that I did have to check a guide because I thought I knew where I was going and I didn't, but... It's a Game Boy game. I, I kind of expected that. Learning about the influence behind Link's Awakening is already important in my opinion, but it helps that the frog for whom the bell tolls is one of the best games on the Game Boy. So many games on this console do not stand up nowadays, but this one, I'm telling you, this one's a gem. And also, on the topic of Zelda, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this one real quick. Uh, Marvelous, another Treasure Island. This is an action RPG about three children solving puzzles and discovering secrets to find the Marvelous Treasure. And you may look at this as well and say, hey, also looks like a Zelda game, it looks like A Link to the Past. Yes, 
because this was, in fact, the very first game directed by Eiji Aonuma, who would go on to be the primary producer for Zelda games going forward. And again, similar to Frog Game, it may look like a Zelda clone, especially since the fan translation straight up uses the Link to the Past font, but this game also really does its own thing. There's no combat or dungeons to worry about, nothing like that. Just a bunch of puzzles in a giant area to explore. In a world where the Super Nintendo has provided some of the greatest RPGs of all time that all stand the test of time, it is worth checking out this hidden gem. But I digress. Back on the GBA side of things, Tomato Adventure! An adventure about tomatoes, kinda. By comparison, this adventure is nowhere near as special as the frog for whom the bell tolls, but hey, it's a cutesy RPG by Alpha Dream, released nearly two years before Superstar Saga. And looking at all of the sprites with their bold outlines, these quirky tutorial sequences, and a unique timing-based battle system, it is clear to see where some of Superstar Saga's key features stem from. You get it? I said, I said stem, because of, of a tomato. You are Demille, a kid who lives on the outskirts of the Ketchup Kingdom in Kobor Village, where you have been banished from the kingdom along with all of your friends because you all, uh, you guys don't, you don't like tomatoes. That's, that's the reason. Tomato discrimination? Was that kid? You don't like Brussels sprouts? Well, I'm sorry, Jimmy. Guess you're going to hell. Eventually, you get to have a bit of a glimpse of the outside of the village with your friend, and then she gets kidnapped, and then you do the typical super simple RPG thing that you'd come to expect, and it's, it's fun, it's fun, but when I mean simple, I mean really simple. Mario RPGs were always these sort of gateway RPGs, games that if you're not too in tune with the genre, they are perfectly easy to get into. But Tomato Adventure is one of the easiest RPGs I have ever played. Super charming, so that was enough to keep me going, and I was having a pretty good time. But if you saw this thing here and thought that this was gonna evoke like Xenoblade or Persona vibes, I hate to break it to you, but no. In fact, it's to be believed that this game didn't get localized because its target demographic was simply too young. Well, it's a, it's a good thing those Hamtaro games they published were so hardcore. I don't know what it was about the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo making games that they simply wanted nobody to play, man. Densetsu no Staffy, Kududin, Rhythm Tengoku, games that did see at least one iteration get an English release on different consoles across different regions, but we got Japanese exclusives here too. A bunch of them. Starfy in particular, and this one hurts my heart. Around the world, we got the legendary Starfy for the DS, and while that is great they finally gave the series a shot outside of Japan, this is actually the fifth game in the series, with the first three on GBA and game four on the DS as well. Now these adventures do feature a lot of text, so there are some story beats that non-Japanese speakers can't understand, but quite frankly, you still got these visuals of a starfish and a clam being dumb little guys underwater, helping their friends, all that fun stuff. I'm, I'm sure you can figure it out. You keep pushing forward, you spin to your heart's content until you get a bit of a headache, I can relate to that one. Partake in a handful of minigames, occasionally ride with some animal mounts, that's, that's flat out adorable, and you're in for a nice little time. It's basically like an easier Kirby game, but like the entire thing is a water level. That makes the game sound terrible, but I, that, that's not what I meant. The first four games in this series even start with the same first boss. They were pulling a Wispy Woods here too, the Kirby comparisons are totally appropriate. And with a total of five games in this series, you would think that some of the sequels would add some things to really change up the formula, and while that is certainly kinda true with some structural differences, you can even play a Starfy sister Starly in the latter half of the series, for the most part, the further along you get with these games, it is just more of the same every time. Except, except Wario is in the third game for some reason, for like a few minutes. Still trying to figure that one out. Love Starfy, love him to bits, I just want him to call home to let me know that he's okay. Kudu Kudu Kududin. So, PAL territories were lucky enough to receive the first game in this series, but the sequels, Kududin Paradise and Kududin Squash, stayed in Japan. And similar to Starfy, these games are kind of just more of the same as the first game. They don't really change things up too much, but I'm still mad that they didn't get localized, okay? Why did Europe get the first Kududin game and not America? I don't- uh, do, we, do we hate spinning things, I guess? So, for the uninformed out there, a Kududin is actually a toy. It's like this wooden stick that you would spin, and that's it. So, let's take that idea, make a ship out of it, have a cute little bird command it, and throw him into these little puzzle rooms where you're constantly spinning, and you have to make it to the end without- Jesus Christ. It's all about learning the path, learning when to use the speed up function and when to take it slow, and whether or not you want to make your ship all squiggly as a cosmetic option. It's actually very important. 
Now, to be fair, it's not like all three games are exactly the same. Paradise introduces a few mini games that are a fun little distraction that do further the idea of spinning sticks and then squash, well, we're on the GameCube now. The control in the GBA games with the D-pad isn't much of an issue, but having full analog support in this one, oh, oh, Kududin Squash is beautiful. Plus now there's some additional mechanics, like being able to go underwater for a bit, you got some on-rail segments which are surprisingly tricky at times, and there's even combat with boss battles? <laughs> what? Okay. What's possible with this formula definitely got stretched pretty thin by the third game, but all in all, a really solid puzzle game trilogy that I am very upset didn't come out here. There's no language barrier, there's no reason for them to not get localized, but here we are. But it's a good thing we got Odama. Rhythm Tengoku. I have been wanting to talk about this franchise on my channel for the longest time now. Oh my god, it's, it's finally time. Rhythm Heaven is, without a doubt, one of my favorite Nintendo series ever. You mix WarioWare with Rhythm Game, featuring constant bangers from start to finish with these amazing soundtracks, and dare I say, the remix stages that compile multiple minigames into one song are some of the most satisfying gaming experiences Nintendo has ever provided. And you know, thanks to Beyonce in 2009, Rhythm Heaven was released worldwide for the DS, later followed by Fever on the Wii and Mega Mix on 3DS. Heaven, I guess, was too controversial a term in Europe, uh, so it's, it's Rhythm Paradise over there. Whatever, just play these games, they're amazing. However, yes, the series roots can be found back on the Game Boy Advance with Rhythm Tengoku, with the commonly accepted fan name Rhythm Heaven Silver, since the DS game in Japan was Rhythm Tengoku Gold, Silver is worse than Gold, so th there you go, there's, there's the logic. It plays almost exactly like the rest of the games in the series, which essentially boils down to needing to press buttons in a rhythm to react to other audio or visual cues. Constantly bouncing on sea life as a rabbit with pauses in between as you fly into the air super high up, hitting baseballs to the music while the screen keeps playing tricks on you. The tap dancing monkeys, oh my god, this game has tap dancing monkeys. For a few of the songs, there's even fully voiced audio. That's very impressive for the Game Boy Advance. Remix 5 in this game is an absolute jam. And even when you just finish the stages, which all things considered, the campaign is very short, you have a bunch of other mini games that you can dive into, you can go for a perfect in every stage, which is very, very stressful, but very satisfying. I just... I just, I just want everyone to play Rhythm Heaven, man, okay, it's one of my favorite things, and Karate Joe deserves to be in Smash more than Kazuya, that's just a fact, I'm sorry. And God would I ever kill to get that Rhythm Tengoku arcade cabinet in America. Holy, that's a thing of beauty right there. All those GBA games that we didn't get, why not? I mean, on top of the games I mentioned, there's Fire Emblem, the game that Roy starred in, dubbed Binding Blade, that is Japanese exclusive. You would think that the character having that smash rub would have gotten that game localized sooner, but nope, still only in Japan. There's the Bit Generation series of very little artistic puzzle games by the Chibi Robo developers, which are just neat and quirky. Some of them you can only still find via GBA cartridge, though thankfully these did continue with some of the games being ported over with the Art Style series on Wii and DS, so that's kind of nice. There was this motion-controlled puzzle game called Koro Koro Puzzle, which is super cool and way more interesting than Yoshi's stupid universal gravitation. The fact that Advance Wars somehow got localized is a flat-out miracle. That series had entries on the Famicom, Super Famicom, the Game Boy, but I guess they figured, hey, you know what? Those guys in the West, they like war way more than they like birds and spinning sticks. Let's fund that instead. Nintendo was really firing on all cylinders during the GBA generation. It's a good thing we did get most of their really, really great games. We got Minish Cap, Metroid Zero Mission, DK King of Swing. All I'm saying is we would have been much better off as a society if we got Famicom Mini Clue Clue Land. And if we're talking Nintendo and Game Boy here, there's arguably no better fitting franchise than Pokemon. As I mentioned before, of course we have Pokemon Green, an interesting starting point in the most financially profitable franchise of all time, and thankfully that is the only mainline game to stay overseas. However, when it comes to spin-offs, oh, we have a lot more interesting little nuggets of software here. Like, you know how we got Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2, where the minigames are the best part of the whole package? I think, that's an, I think that's an objective fact. Well, in Japan, those two games are titled Pokemon Stadium 2 and Pokemon Stadium Gold and Silver. Pokemon Stadium 1 in Japan is, it's just the battling part with just 40 of the original Gen 1 lineup. That's it. Uh, why, why did they release this? You could still play your Game Boy games with the transfer pack, which, I, I mean, that's cool, I guess, but 
Otherwise, this game is pointless. The stadium that we all know and love released not even a year later, so why this blatantly unfinished product made it to store shelves is beyond me. There's probably a story attached to it, but I, I don't I don't care. The Pokemon company making a strange decision? Wow, that that's unheard of. Did you know that there was a DS game in Japan that was more or less just a glorified tutorial for the trading card game? There's really not much more to Pokemon card game how to play DS, and considering I don't play the TCG, nor do I speak Japanese, it's just a cool looking box to me. I like Gen 5, so having Gen 5 stuff like this, that's, that's cool, that's the best part of the game. But what's even more interesting with the TCG is the proper little RPG they made for the Game Boy Color. I loved this as a kid. Obviously nowadays we're working on very dated mechanics, but it's such a cool pocket in time this is. Even me, someone who wasn't ever into the TCG, had a lot of fun with this. And they made a second one in Japan only? Pokemon Card GB2, Great Rocket Don Sanjo. Thankfully now with the fan translation, always gotta clarify that because man, now I can play this game to completion and that is, that is very cool. It's more of the same as the previous game with new cards and some other changes like the ability to choose your player's gender. That's nice. But hey, you get to work towards taking down Team Rocket in this one. That's all I ever wanted to do as a kid. Why did this game not make the cut? It doesn't make any sense. But in my opinion, no Japanese exclusive Pokemon game struck my interest more than Pokemon Mystery Dungeon for WiiWare. That's right, for WiiWare. Yeah, if you thought the Rescue Team Remake was the first game in the series to release on consoles, uh, sorry, no, you dumb, you big dumb dumb. I can't believe you didn't know about Keep Going Wildfire Adventure Squad, Let's Go Tempest Adventure Squad, and Go For It Radiant Adventure Squad. Okay, that was, that was a lot of words. I, I can see why they didn't localize these games now. Admittedly, I haven't gotten around to playing these yet, I definitely plan on checking out these Mystery Dungeon games in the future, but right off the bat, having one of these Mystery Dungeon games with the weird toy-like art design from the Rumble games? I can't say I'm a fan. Plus, it's the only game in this series to have three versions released at the same time, with bonuses unlockable by connecting them together. I don't know what expectations the Pokemon company had with this very ambitious trio release for WiiWare of all platforms, but considering this is the actual follow-up to Explorers of Sky, which many kids have cited they have emotional trauma from, I really don't think this is something worth being upset about missing. A cool novelty, maybe I'm wrong with it being actually good, I'll give this game its time one day. One day. Man, and while we're on the topic of the Wii, the amount of games that we didn't get for that console too is astounding. Some of you may remember Operation Rainfall, a fan-made movement to convince Nintendo to localize Xenoblade Chronicles, The Last Story, and Pandora's Tower. Three RPGs that showed a lot of promise that could have filled an otherwise dead schedule from 2011 to 2013. And while that's all fine and good, we obviously got those games, and they're all great. Like, all three games are really, really good, especially Xenoblade. Dude, how did everyone else forget about Earthseeker, Zangeki no Regenleaf, Line Attack Heroes, Disaster Day of Crisis, which released in Europe, but not in America, fighting Captain Rainbow? We may have gotten three heavy hitters, but we still missed out on some really good games that, only recently, all finally have fan translations, and they all come highly recommended. Earthseeker, to be fair, isn't a Nintendo published game, so that goes against the rules of what I was saying before, but I wanted to mention it anyway, it's my video, shut up. Let's start off with Line Attack Heroes, probably the least known of the bunch. This is a WiiWare game all about hacking and slashing enemies so they will then join your line of attackers and then you can wipe out your opponent with ease. It's pretty straightforward. The goals may change, but how you get to the end basically remains the same. It's quirky, it's satisfying to control. For a game that had to stick to the WiiWare insane 40 megabyte file size limit, this gets a thumbs up from me. Quite frankly, any game that released on that service is a miracle. Plus, this is also the debut game for Grezzo, the studio that would later on remaster the 64 Zelda games for 3DS, remaking Link's Awakening and Miitopia for Switch, and making Street Pass Flower Crown for the 3DS as well, arguably their best work. So yes, this game is very, very notable. But now on to actual games. First off, we have Zangeki no Regenleave, or now fan-dubbed Blades of Regenleave. This is an action game all about taking down hordes of enemies in an effort to stop the apocalypse, Ragnarok. And that that's kind of it. You can get a bunch of new weapons and gear and whatnot, but that's more or less the entire game. It's pretty jank, I'm not gonna lie, but it utilizes Wii Motion Plus, so it's right up there with Fling Smash. I can only complain so much. If this game were to have been localized, it likely wouldn't have won any awards, but a game of this style was something the Wii was desperately lacking. It would have totally been welcome. It even featured online co-op at the time. That's shockingly ambitious for that console. 
Being able to run around these large landscapes and take down huge monsters with some decent motion controls and some friends along the way, it's experiences like this that made me the Wii fan that I am. But no other game featured on this video encapsulates pure Japanese absurdity with the perfect amount of Nintendo magic like Captain Rainbow, brought to us by Skip Limited. Also known as the company Nintendo screwed over the most. You know about Chibi Robo, right? Yeah, those guys. We already discussed the bit generations and art style games in the past, but Chibi Robo is easily the thing that this company is the most known for. This cute and wacky adventure where you play as a little robot who just wants to clean up and make friends, it's just delightful all around. And it got multiple sequels with no actual pushing from Nintendo, so the series died a slow and painful death. I hate this company so much. We got a sequel on the DS with Park Patrol, but that was only released exclusively to Walmart. Then there was another DS sequel, however that stayed in Japan, which is crazy because while Park Patrol changed up the formula a little bit, and that was fine, this game with the now fan translated title Clean Sweep plays like a proper follow-up to the original game, and it is just about as absurd and about house cleaning as you could want in a Chibi Robo game. But I mean, you saw what happened after Photo Finder and Ziplash, Chibi Robo was never given a chance. Hell, This Little Robot's Adventure was the only title in the short-lived new Play Control series on the Wii to not get localized. Widescreen, some motion controls, and now thankfully there's a fan translation, so it's just as playable as the original GameCube version. This is really cool, and it would have given this game a second chance at life, but what do I know, I guess? Chibi Robo's story is just flat out tragic, because you can tell the series had a lot of love put into it when Skip tried to see their vision fulfilled to its fullest. Just the mere concept of putting a pretty regular character in an adventure filled with the wackiest cast you've ever seen and you're just expected to accept anything thrown your way was something that Skip had mastered. We missed out on another adventure too on the GameCube with Gift Pia, which yeah, it's exactly like that, so it's awesome. It was even originally set to release outside of Japan. It showed up at E3 2003, but nope, as we've discussed before, we're not allowed nice things. But this is all just my long roundabout way of going back to Skip's greatest work easily, Captain Rainbow. This game, oh man. Dude, it's like, okay, you are Nick, an ordinary guy who used to play a popular TV superhero, Captain Rainbow, and eventually you wake up washed up on Mimin Island, a land where wishes are set to come true, and you are now on a quest to regain your popularity. And it just so happens this land is filled with other washed up Nintendo characters. This is brilliant. You got some more well-known ones like Birdo and Little Mac, but he's fat now, that's hilarious but also the army from Famicom Wars, Takamaru from the mysterious Murasame Castle, the devil from Devil World, and even Osan from NES Golf. Everyone said it used to be Mario, but nope, we found out here, it's Osan. And in this game, he plays with his balls. His, his golf balls, you guys, his golf, he's a golfer, it's his golf balls. Get your mind out of the sand trap. Balls. Simply running around and trying to discover all of the island's secrets and helping out all these characters get their wishes granted, there is never a dull moment on this adventure. It is so, so good. Guys, okay, like, when Hikari here gets you to finally transform into the perfect body shape to fit this oddly specific hole in the back of her residence, wow, perfect, that Captain Rainbow just happens to fit in. You, f <laughs> you find a Famicom disc system in the back? I'm gonna lose it. There is no fan translation that I am more grateful to have access to than this one. It's excellent. When I first ran into Birdo in a jail cell, uh, yeah, my curiosity certainly peaked. I've heard many a story about this interaction over the years, but I was still not prepared for what I got to experience here. So, it turns out, uh, this robot here, Mappo, who's from Gift Pia, by the way, and Mimin Island's police officer, jailed Birdo because they were seen coming out of the women's restroom despite Mappo swearing they were a man, which leads to Birdo begging you to go to her house to find proof of her being a woman, to which you find a mysterious item that was vibrating under her pillow on her bed. But hey, it's, it's, it's okay, it's okay, I eventually sent Birdo off into space, never to be seen again. She wanted this, I promise you. This game, this, this, this is, this is one of the games of all time. From interesting little novelties like Donkey Kong Land 3 in color, to Yoshi making Cookie Simulator, to grand adventures with fantastical worlds and unforgettable characters like the legendary Starfy and Captain Rainbow, there is so much that Japan got easy access to at retail that the rest of the world 
just missed out on. And it's still happening to this day, Buddy Mission Bond, why? That would be so cool. Sure, some of these games have found their way overseas in an official capacity in one form or another, but it's pretty safe to say that a majority of these games are locked behind emulation for only the most curious of fans to get to play. And if anybody watching this was ever responsible, even in the most minor sense, to any of the fan translations shown in this video, you have my most sincere thank you. I am a fan of everything Nintendo man, and not just of their heavy hitters, so being able to have all of these games that were hidden away for so long, just a few clicks away now? I'm gonna be expanding my Nintendo repertoire for a long time, and I highly recommend you all do the same. You're really missing out. I hope I encourage some of you out there to give these games a shot. You know, the modern gaming space can sometimes be filled with toxicity and console fanboyism. It's just sometimes not fun, and it's not worth it. If you ever want to deviate from the path and try something totally new, this is the place to do it, I guarantee. With some of these games, maybe not all, but some, you're gonna have a great time. Now, with that being said, that's all the time I've got. I'm gonna get back to playing Tingle's Balloon Fight on my Nintendo 3DS. I'm more fulfilled now.